All right, notice what he says here in verse number two. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Now, we've already covered the thing about exhortation, and I've uh, talked to you on a number of occasions now about uh, even in encouraging yourself. Look, if you will, please, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, just to reiterate this, because some of you need this probably more than you need the message I'm going to preach to you this morning. Uh, some of you are way too hard on yourself. It's become an accepted norm among Bible believers. And when I say to be a little bit more positive, I'm not talking about, you know, thinking about some pyramid scheme where if you think it, you do it, or you go out and get as many credit cards as you can and then wind up flipping a bunch of real estate and become some flipper, flopper, flipper, flop doodle thing. Or, and now that you, you know, you make millions of dollars because you overextend yourself at the bank and, and those kind of things. I, I don't think those things are beneficial because they're not built on a biblical principle. I don't believe, as one guy told me, he said, the reason I have a Lamborghini on my wall is, is I think about the Lamborghini every day because I'm going to have one one day. I know the guy, he still doesn't have a Lamborghini. <laughs> I don't know what those things cost now, but back in the day, they were about $400,000 for a car. So uh, that was back then. I don't know what they're worth now, but the idea of having a Lamborghini, I guess, would have to do with reputation or saying that I'm successful because of the car I drive or, or whatever. When I talk about being positive, I'm talking about understanding that all things become, uh, the, behold, all things are passed away and all things become new. I'm talking about some of you who can't get past your past mistakes and you hang around people that won't let you go of your past mistakes. Now, I'm going to say something that's a little bit harsh. I believe in biblical separation. But generally what that's taught is, is it's taught you separate from people that drink and smoke and cuss and chew and do things that people shouldn't do and that kind of a deal. Some of you need to extricate yourself from the people that are always down on you all the time and always reminding you of your past. You need to get away from people that are always demeaning. They're always putting you down. You know, that little tongue-in-cheek jabbing you all the time. You know, after a while, that paper cuts will make you bleed to death. It's just, you know, life by a million cuts. You have to make the decision. They're not going to get away from you. You have to make the decision to get away from them. If every time you're around them, they're putting you down, then get away from them. That doesn't mean you need to be around people that are always telling you how wonderful and great and marvelous and outstanding you are. Marriage is for that. But when it comes to... When it comes to the people you hang around with, ladies and gentlemen, you need to get away from the, the naysayers all the time. You know, the chicken little syndrome, the sky's falling, everything's bad. You know, you woke up this morning and it's, I don't know, 30 something degrees. We actually had a little bit of ice in Jacksonville. Oh, okay. Well, good. It kills the bug, bugs back. It kills mosquitoes. You have less of a mosquito. So they have less to complain about in the, in the summertime. All these mosquitoes. The Lord's like, well, you didn't want cold weather to kill the mosquito larva. And so, you know, I don't, which way do you want it? It's like the children in the wilderness, you know. Well, it's just manna from heaven. It's just manna from heaven. Did you have to plow the ground to get it? Did you have to pick the plants to get it? Did you have to go hunt for it or anything? All you got to do is get a basket, walk out your front door, pick it up and put it in. I mean, that's the beginning of 7-Eleven right there. That's the original minute market. You walk in, you walk out the door, you put it in there in a couple of minutes, and there it is. It's self-preserving. You don't even have to have a refrigerator. <laughs> and then he says, and by the way, I have a special day for you. It's one day you don't have to do anything. You go out there and gather it on Friday. That'll be enough for Saturday. But if you gather it like that any other day, it'll rot. Would you agree it's supernatural? Yeah. They griped about it. They griped about it because they didn't have water. And Moses got mad about it. And I realized he hit the rock twice. But you'd have hit the rock twice too if all you heard was griping and complaining all the time. You know, we were better off when we were in Egypt. It was just so much better over there. Better in Egypt. Pharaoh was in charge of you, killing you right and left. You have Hebrew midwives that are trying to get the nation born out there that are having your kids in secret and stuff. They're slaughtering your kids. They're throwing them in the Nile River. You have garlic and leeks to eat, and that's it. You're making bricks without straw, and you're not allowed to let the number of the bricks grow down. Better in Egypt? How is it better in Egypt? complaining, griping, moaning, and groaning all the time. Well, we, we want something else. The Lord said, okay, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll send you quail. 
Well, I hate to tell you, he didn't send it to him on a silver platter already cooked with a little uh, uh, legs up there in the air, you know, with a couple of quail eggs. They had to actually go out and pick it up and, and you know, pluck the feathers off of it and cook it. He sent them so much quail, the Bible said it was running out of their nose. You say, what'd they do? Complain. You know why that thing's so important? That happened all the way back in Exodus. That thing is so important that when the Apostle Paul is talking to the church there in Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter number 10, he said, as they were in the back then. And he's saying that to the carnal church. Now, I don't mean to be hard on you this morning. I realize it's the Christmas season and a happy new year and all that other kind of stuff. But could uh, Paul preach that sermon today? I think so. It's in the first Corinthians. You say, why? Gripe and gripe and gripe and gripe and gripe and gripe. Anybody hungry this morning? Didn't get something to eat? Have an extra cup of coffee or two? Was your, car, uh, was your car not heating up for you fast enough this morning? You go out and remote start it so it would be warm when you got in it and defrost or turn the ice off your windshield. This is rough, isn't it? It's tough. You know, my heater kicked on this morning. I got up, I was like, Ugh. It's, it's, yeah. Come on. She said, what are you doing? I said, I'm turning up the heater. <laughs> I didn't have to go out in the yard and go cut me some firewood and throw it up there on the fire or grab me another. I didn't even put, I didn't put on an extra shirt. I could have done that. I just, <laughs> thing comes on, <laughs> blows for a little while, and then I'm like, man, it's getting hot in here. <laughs> Lord's like, yeah, that's how you are. You're hot one minute and cold a minute. You think you're in menopause or something like that. You can't make up your cotton-picking mind. You say, why is that important? It has been now considered to be spiritual if you're constantly down on yourself. It's a facade. You're not that down on yourself. Right. It's a way for you to wind up for somebody trying to tell you what you're seeking, which is attention. Well, I'm just no good. I'm just lower and well poop in the bottom of the ocean. You know, I'm just so, I had a rough upbringing. I had this and that and the other. Okay. Are you saved? Yes, sir. Yeah, amen. You have a new father. Yes, sir. I had, there's a verse in the Bible somewhere in there. I think it's in the New Testament. It might be somewhere around Philippians, but it says this. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. There's a passage, I believe it's in Romans. He said, all things work together for good to them, love God, then to the called according to his purpose. Christians, would be of all the people that should be complaining, it shouldn't be Christians. Christians shouldn't be complaining. What's the matter? You didn't get what you wanted under the tree this year? Didn't you know we were in tough economic times? Didn't you know that the virus was here? <laughs> Probably had a hanging on your tree this year. You had a bunch of masks hanging on your tree. You know, one for every day of the year, you know. <laughs> you know, well, did you hear about the hospitals? No. No, I didn't. Well, did you hear about this yet? No, I didn't. You say, why? It didn't affect anything I did. I want you to think back in the last two weeks, all the stuff you got jacked up about. Has your life changed any in the last two weeks? What were you so worried about? Some of you people believe that stuff more than you believe the Bible. Well, preach, you got to be informed. <laughs> you think you can get up there in eternity, you get to the judgment seat of Christ, and you're there in front of Jesus Christ, and he says, what was the latest headline? I, I, yeah, I've been, been kind of worried about that. <laughs> what part of the world were you living in? <laughs> I was living in the United States. <laughs> you were living in the United States. What state? United, that's funny. You, <laughs> what state were you in? What county were you in? What city were you in? What was happening in the town where you were located? Because all you have is just a condensed version of things. You spend all your time researching that, and he'll say to you, could you quote me a verse on how you ought to handle your finances? No, Lord, but I can quote you the headlines. I'm not trying to be hard on you. I'm, I'm trying to be positive. <laughs> you can't be positive and mess with the news media all the time. The news is news because it's not positive. They have what they call a human interest. Some of you are mad already. I'm just getting started. It's Sunday school. Smile. God loves you. <laughs> you, you. You're already looking at, you're, pre you're predicting 2021. <laughs> you don't even know if you're going to be here. You don't know if you're going to be here in 15 minutes. You might flop out or the Lord might blow the horn and get us out of here. So preacher, how come you hadn't preached on the rapture? I don't want to get your hopes up. 
You ought to be wanting to see Jesus, not trying to escape whatever may come. You ought to be, I, I like to go to heaven. Why? I'd like to see Jesus. I'm sure it's going to be an amazing thing, but that's not a, it's not the place, it's the person. So let me, ask you, let me ask you a question. Any of you realize that back in 1942, 1943, that because uh, some uh, Serbians wouldn't accept uh, the Roman Catholic faith, they killed uh, 260,000 260, of them in the name of religion? There's some history to be worried about. If you were living back then, I'd, I'd say that'd be a headline to be concerned about. And you're concerned about whether or not you're going to have to have a, a vaccine pass to travel? Amen. Did you know in 1945 you couldn't travel anywhere in any states that were run by Germany without a pass? Did you know that when we went in the 70s over to Israel, did you know that you could not go from what you would call from county to county? You couldn't cross the Julington Creek Bridge there without a passport and a pass to be able to pass literally across the county line. That was going on back then. Back then they had uh, barricades set up and you had in an, in an S-way for all the buses and all the cars to come through with tanks and machine gun nests up on the corners. And they stop you. Well, they can't stop me. He did us. They came on the bus, got us all off the bus, lined us up there and went through everybody's passport. You say, what was that? That's in the 70s. You know how they parked us in Tel Aviv? They pulled us up in Tel Aviv. We pulled there. You're used to pulling into jetways and stuff like that. <laughs> they parked us out in the, the, the tarmac. How dare them after we spent all that money on TWA to fly to Israel for some tourist vacation trip over there to see some of the sights there. How dare them treat us that way? Then they put us all, herded us like cattle into a thing and then went through all of our cotton picking uh, uh, suitcases, took everything out in front of everybody. I mean underwear going everywhere and all kind of private stuff all over the creation and they didn't even fold it and pack it and put it back in there. They just shoved it down the line. It's kind of like you put it back together. And you know what you did? You didn't say anything. And they look at the pass and then they look at you. And they look at the passport and they look at you. Look at the passport and they look at you. And you don't speak the language. And then they go, why don't you tell everybody what That's in the 70s. Preacher, why are you telling me that stuff? People worried back then about a state of world terror. That's 30 years before 9-11. This stuff is not new, ladies and gentlemen. It's to check your focal point. Now, if you want to live a happy, prosperous 2021, and I don't mean in your wallet, you got to get your eyes on something other than the world events. Amen. You watch world events, well, you better balance it out. Yeah. Brother Richard told me the other day, and he was right. I looked up the article. The regular news people that care about you are telling you, don't watch more than 15 minutes a day of any news media. The average amount of time that a person spends in front of a screen right now is 17 hours a day. Look it up. You haven't spent that much time in your life in your Bible. <laughs> you say you don't think it matters? Why, sure, the prince of the power of the air is trying to control how you think. Amen. That's why you need Bible. You say, why? He's trying to control how you think. So they got it on every outlet. You get it on your phone. You get it on your iPad. You get it on your iPod. You get nation-breaking news. You get Twitter and Snapchat and Instagram and TikTok and all the other things. More media, more media, more media, more media because you're, you're so much more informed, see. I know so many more things. Yeah, but the question is, is the things you know, are they worth knowing? When you kick the bucket, I have a friend of mine in Alabama that's doing bad right now, real bad. He's on a respirator, ventilator. He's a friend of a brother-in-law of a real close friend of mine, and he's fixing to cross over. You think his, you think his wife and kids are watching the news and what's going on in Nashville right now? 
You ever stop and think why stuff like that happens? You weren't paying attention. Got to have something happen major so that it make you look back at them again. They're hiding something. Watch the birdie. Watch the birdie. Watch the birdie. Don't get distracted by all this Christmas stuff and having uh, Christmas services and candlelight. Don't get, don't get on the religious stuff. Don't get on the real stuff. Watch the birdie. <laughs> you watching the feed on it? You've been watching the feed on this? Look in that passage in 1 Samuel chapter 30. I'm not getting on to you. I'm just trying to encourage you. It's okay not to be informed in that. Here's a good thing for you. It makes somebody fall out of their chair. Do y'all go back to work tomorrow? Yep. I've been at work, so I didn't want to. Y'all, y'all go back to work tomorrow, Monday, a regular day? You get till New Year's Eve, I guess, before you get off, half day or whatever. You go back to work tomorrow. Somebody says, did you see so-and-so? No. <laughs> it fall right out on the floor. Did you hear about so-and-so? No. Did you see what happened yesterday? Yeah, man, we had church service yesterday. I saw what happened. I drove out of my neighborhood this morning. I'm not saying they're all going to hell. They're all a bunch of heathens. I didn't see a single person. Two things. Number one, they weren't in their yard. It's too cold. (laughs) I felt like Solomon riding out of my neighborhood this morning. Solomon said, a little more sleep, a little more slumber, a little bit more folding of the hands. Why? It's too cold to plow. A couple days ago, it was too wet to plow. A couple days before that, it was too hot to plow. You say, what's happening? The field ain't getting plowed. Look at that passage in 1 Samuel chapter number 30. David comes back from uh, out in, uh, to Ziklag and he comes back from being in the wrong place at the wrong time, hanging out with the wrong people. You know the story. He didn't leave uh, anybody to guard the household while he was gone. He left his wife and children uh, unprotected. He left all of his possessions unprotected. And he left out of there as if nobody would dare attack him. And he goes out there and he's fighting for the wrong cause and he's doing the wrong thing and they wind up winning over there and then he comes back and in his mind's eye he's victorious and he gets back to Ziklag. I'm in 1 Samuel 30 and he comes back and he finds the city burned to the ground and he finds all of his wife and children gone but he doesn't see dead bodies so he's assuming they've been taken captive or slaves and all of his material possessions are gone. This is a God's anointed king over Israel. This is, the, this is the shepherd boy that's anointed king. This is a guy that's uh, called, uh, David says, uh, God liked me. This is a guy that God says about him, uh, David is a man after my own heart. He's a guy that would be a prince in the millennium. He comes back, you know what he has? He has the clothes on his back and the horse to ride on. You say, but he's got the people with him. No, you read a little further, you know what happens? They all lift up their voices and they weep. In that passage, if you're following down there, they all lift up their voices and they weep. And the Bible said, they spake of stoning him. They're looking for a scapegoat. It's all David's fault. David should have known better. David should have seen the future. David should have been paying attention. David should have left a guard behind. David should have done this. David should have done that. So what are we going to do? We're going to blame David. We're going to kill David. What does David do? Retaliate? What does David do? He set himself. Do you see that? Where's that? In my Bible, it's on the right-hand page, left-hand column. He set, or no, I'm sorry, it's a left-hand page, right-hand column. He set himself to do what? Seek the Lord. Isn't that in there? Is it in there? Encouraged himself in what? And he called for, didn't he call for the preacher? But isn't there something else? What in the cat hair is an ephod? Do you know what an ephod is? An ephod is the priest's garment. You know what that is? It has the 12 tribes, the stones that are on it. Now, I don't have time to go into all of that stuff, but you know what happened with those stones? Those stones had the names of the tribe of Israel on them. They were letters, Hebrew letters, Hebrew alphabet. You want to know where you get lights on a Christmas tree? Ephod, it lights up. It sends a message. He inquired of the priest and the priest brings the ephod. For you, that'd be the Bible. He inquired of the Lord and the Bible said, and David encouraged himself in the Lord. What? Makes you wonder if all the other people's God was their possessions or their families or their victories or their reputations. They're ready to kill somebody for it. 
Look at it. It's right in the passage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. David is in the moment of great distress. You say, what does he do? He calls for the priest and he calls for the ephod. He calls for the preacher and he calls for the Bible. He doesn't care as much about what the preacher says. He knows the preacher is in the one wearing the ephod and the ephod is going to tell him what he should and shouldn't do. And so we inquire to the Lord and the thing lights up and spells it out. <laughs> That's the original Bible code. That thing lights up that way and spells out, Shall I pursue? Y E S. Shall I overtake? Y E S. You know what David does after he encourages himself in the Lord? He says, boys, while y'all are over gathering stones and stuff that I used to kill the giant with and those kind of things, while y'all are getting all that stuff ready to kill me, you're going to have a hard time hitting me because it's hard to hit a moving target. Why is that, David? Because I'm leaving. The Lord told me to go pursue and I'm going to recover them. You want to get in on it or not? Amen. What do you think would have happened, preacher, if the rest of them said they weren't going? I think David would have single-handedly whipped the Amalekites and brought back the whole nation of Israel at the time by himself. See, surely you're not that stupid. Surely I have that much faith. Amen. God said he would pursue. God said he would overtake. And they decided to get on what he's doing. You come down through that passage there and there's a couple of old guys that want to go with him. They can't go any farther. They stop by the brook before. You know how the story goes there. Preacher, why are you trying to tell me that? David was at the lowest point in his life in a very long time. You know what he had to do? The people around him wouldn't encourage him. God didn't come down in a burning bush or in the sound of going over in the mulberry trees. God didn't speak to him out of uh, uh, come down there as an angel. God spoke to him through a preacher and a Bible, through the ephod, and responded to his questions. Lord, what am I going to do now? This is a terrible thing. This is a horrible thing. He said, Lord, should I go after him? Yep. Am I going to overtake him? Yep. Okay, enough for me. I'm out of here. What am I trying to point out to you? You can't depend on people to always be encouraged and you've got to encourage yourself. Amen. Stop being so hard on yourself. Amen. I can tell you the truth, ladies and gentlemen. This is a bit of a difficult thing for me to tell you, but it's true nonetheless. I've done the studying on it. You do your own studying on it. But the reason some of you people are so rough, so hard, so crass, so mean, so sarcastic to other people is because of how you think of yourself. Amen. You don't give yourself a break, so you don't give anybody around you a break. And you're just downright mean to people. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. You're just, just harsh with people. Glass always half empty. Never, never enough. Always something else wrong. Always something else bad. You're the children of Israel. 1 Corinthians 10. Wandering around. Well, we got manna. Man, I went out there, man. Mine fell in the rye grass. You know how sticky that grass is, man? I picked the stuff up. It's like getting a wheatgrass sundae or something. And mine had grass in it. Yeah, well, I, mine fell in the sand. Mine had a little grit in it. Well, good. You need a little cleaning out every now and then. And well, some of mine got stuck up in the tree and I had to reach up there to get it out of there. You know what griping and complaining is, ladies and gentlemen? It is the epitome of carnality. It is saying, I don't have a good father. He's a good father. Oh, he just gave us manna. Just gave us quail. Uh, just delivered you out of Egypt after 400 years in captivity. Just took you out of Pharaoh supernaturally, brought you across the Red Sea, taken into a land filled with milk and honey, and he just gave you manna. Or is that all you remembered? I'm getting on this morning's message a little bit, ladies and gentlemen, but it's hard to stop the flow when the flow's coming. The Lord's coming out there. They're caught in the middle of another storm. This is after the feeding of the 5,000. And they're coming out there and they come to the Lord and they say, Lord, we don't know about this and we don't know about that. You know what the Lord's response is? They forgot the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. You mean to tell me after what I just did, you're griping about this. Some of you have been delivered from bad marriages. Some of you have been delivered from disease. Some of you have been delivered from bad bosses. Some of you have now been delivered from bad financial decisions. 
and God's looked out for you and all you do is complain about it was 30 degrees outside today. I had to walk out there to my car and crank it up. The seats were cold. About froze my behind off. Most of you, unless you're driving something that was created in the, uh, in the late 90s, most of you have a button you push and it'll warm your hind end up. Even in Florida. <laughs> your little fingers are cold. You just mash the button and the steering wheel's heated now. You forget the days of driving a car where the hole was in the bottom of the floorboard and you were just grateful that God got you from point A to point B. You come a long way, baby. Car tag in the bottom with a piece of cardboard and some duct tape. Look like Fred Flintstone running down the road. Feet dangling across the bottom. Try to avoid puddles and stuff like that because the stuff come in and flood your car out. And you wind up in there wearing rubber boots because the inside of your car is flooded out. Why don't you have carpet in this thing? Because as soon as I do it, get wet. Well, why? It's, it's not because it comes up through the floor. Praying the spark plug doesn't blow, literally blow out of the hole so you can get to work on time. And he got you through, didn't he? You're sitting here, ain't you? Preacher, you sound like you're getting on to us. Well, let me ask you a question. If you were him, how would you feel? Yes, Not about others, about you. Yes, he died for me on Calvary. Amen. I think he died for you too. Yes, Amen. And after saving us from hell, yes. have you ever listened to yourself? Yes. You all got recording devices now, right? So well, you can't record without, well, give yourself permission to record yourself. Look at yourself in the mirror. I'm going to record this conversation and put it in your pocket and let it run all day. And you get to the end of the day, you want to have a sleepless night because of nausea. Turn that thing on and listen to yourself. That's good. And if you're nauseated by it yourself, imagine how, what it is to the people around you. And you're a Christian. The light of the world. 1 Timothy chapter 4. This is just Sunday school. Just kind of warm up. See, preacher, that didn't sound very much like an exhortation. Well, sure it was. It's an exhortation to stop being so stinking hard on yourself. Give yourself a break. Nobody else is going to. <clears throat> that doesn't mean you have to run out 2 Timothy 4. That doesn't mean you have to... Uh, run around. I'm sorry, it is 1 Timothy 4. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to run around uh, and, and play into uh, the modern theology. You know, think, what was, that, what was that guy's name? Think and Grow Rich. That guy, was that Ziegler? Who was that guy? Or was that Tony Robbins or, you know, somebody? You know, he's the guru that, may, if, as, long as, you, as long as you think it, you are it kind of a deal. I'm not talking about that kind of uh, uh, foolishness. I'm talking about, well, I'm working on it. It'd be better tomorrow than I was today. If you're living and breathing, you failed. Isn't it funny? This is this morning's message. How you remember your failures, you don't seem to remember your successes. Isn't that weird? Have you ever done anything right? Well, why don't you give yourself an accolade there? I got saved. Good starting place. Some of you won't let yourself off the mat because of something you've done in your past. Well, you can't change it. Thinking on it don't change nothing. Some of you dwell right there. What somebody did to you. It's done. Can't undo it. Some of you are like that. It's like you drinking the poison and expecting them to die. They're not, they're not worried about it at all. I'm going to give you a little marital advice. You better get accustomed to overlooking things. Ma'am, you will never turn him into what you thought you could turn him into when you first married him. Yes, a hush fell across the crowd. And sir, she is more than just a physical... Uh, um, She's a person. 
And what she is, five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, is different than when you first met her. But you just still upset at something he did 10 years ago, aren't you? Why, you manipulative Jezebel, you. After God forgave you of all he's forgiven you of and you can't forgive that old man for being stupid, you say, what is he? He's just a dumb donkey. He was a dog when you married him and he's still a dog. And you know what you're trying to do by reminding him of his past? You're trying to put that puppy dog on a leash. What you looking down for? It ain't time to pray. Sir, you watch all that filth and garbage you watch and then you look over there and that hourglass Coke bottle turned into a mayonnaise jar and probably because she's stressed out trying to take care of you. And you compare her to what she was when she was 20 instead of the love it takes to stick with you. Why, you old manipulative Ahab, you. The old gray mare ain't what she used to be. You better thank God she's not. Neither are you, bub. You got pictures in your house of your wife when she was 20. What about pictures of her now? You trying to remind her of something? Happier days? Is that, what it, is that what that is? Why don't you encourage her? Why don't you say, baby, I don't have any idea how you put up with me for 20 years. I hope you put up with me for 20 more. Amen. Well, babe, you know you, you know you used to. Yeah, I used to. Uh, I'm wore out, man. My bearings have done wore out. The seals are leaking oil. You say, why? Taking care of you <laughs> and kids and a house and bills. I'm trying to convince you you're way too hard on yourself. You've been taught dwelling on your failures is spiritual success. It's not, and it's not biblical. I'm reading through my Bible this week. I recommend you do it. I told you already to read it, walk through your house and reading. I'm reading through my Bible and I'm, I'm looking. I'm, I'm looking. I'm trying to find. I, I've got to be able to find this. It's in there somewhere. I'm, I'm looking for it. I start in the Pauline epistles. And I'm reading through the Pauline epistles and I'm looking for Paul to remind the people that have been pained to him in the rear end where he's reminding them of their failure. I run across the passage where John Mark shot his mouth off after uh, Paul got off the boat there and blinded the guy. And I read about him nine years later. And instead of uh, Paul saying, you know, I'm not done with that guy. I'm through with that guy. I'm finished with that guy. Paul's getting ready to pass off the scene. You know what he says? He said, bring that boy. He's profitable for the ministry. You mean he forgot the past? I think Paul looked at himself and said, man, the Lord sure forgot my past. You know what people were always trying to do in Acts 26? They were trying to remind the Apostle Paul of his past. You know what Paul said? That's who I used to be. I ain't that person no more and I ain't even going to talk about it. Right, right, right. I'm not justifying it or nothing. Well, it was different. And if you just knew the day and time in which I lived and, and the way modern society was and I was trained this way and it's really not my fault. It was the environment that I was in. Paul doesn't do that. Paul said, I'm guilty of that. But that ain't who I am now. So I get to read and I'm thinking, well, Paul was a pretty good preacher. But I mean, Paul, you know, he got caught up to the third heaven. So what in the cat here would Paul know about how we live? So I figure, you know, who was a better preacher than that? How about Jesus? So I go through Jesus. And I find Jesus and I'm thinking, oh, I'd be pretty upset. I think I'd be pretty upset with a man by the name of Peter. Would you be upset about that? I would. I don't think I'd let him off the mat. He doesn't just, just let it. Peter goes and goes fishing. I'm in John uh, 21. He goes after him. Standing on the beach, cooking some fish and some bread. Pete chucks off and jumps into the 
water there and comes up there on board and uh, Peter's kicking around there in the sand and listening to the waves lap up on the shore there and watching the fire crackle and the sparks flying up there and smelling the fish cooking and he don't feel like eating. He just feels sort of nauseated. And the Lord says, Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know I love you. Feed my lambs. <laughs> he doesn't even dress him down. Feed my sheep, feed my sheep. He never reminds him of it again. We're the ones that remember that Pete's the one that did the denying, not the Lord. Did you ever read the passage in there when they came after the Lord? The Bible said, and they all forsook him. You know who you remember? You remember Thomas and you remember Peter. Do you know the Lord never reminds you of Thomas again after he appears up there and he said, didn't you say you wanted to put your fingers in the nail prints and put your hand in my side? Well, come here. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. And then you know what the Lord's retort to that was? Blessed are those who haven't seen me believe. Yep. Let's get on with it, Thomas. Life's more than just a failure. Hanging on the cross. I remember you, Peter. I remember you, John. I remember you running, laying on my chest there at dinner time, and you took off and ran. I, I remember you. I, I, I didn't do that. You know why you remember that stuff on other people? Because it puts you in the driver's seat. It makes you control other people's lives as if you're justified in doing it. Instead of being as good as God's been to you Amen. and let the cotton picking thing go. Amen. So good. Amen. But you won't do it. You say, why? Because of what you think of yourself. Amen. What you see in the mirror is, oh, I didn't get this and I didn't get that. I wasn't born this way and I wasn't born that way and I, this happened to me and that happened to me. That's society that has bred that there's an excuse for you acting the way you're acting. Well, if you're a new creature in Christ, you don't have an excuse. You can change. If you want to. David encouraged himself in the Lord his God. Where do you go for encouragement when you're down? Hallmark Channel? Hallmark. I have to quit saying that now. We well, watched some Hallmark over the uh, the holidays and stuff like that over the Christmas holidays. You figure they'd be clean. Nearly every one of them things, she'd go, well, look at that. And say, what is that? There's queers in every one of them. Yeah. If they're in the background or whatever, they've even got them kissing now. Yeah, they do. I'm not talking Lifetime. I'm talking Hallmark. Supposed to be the bastion of cleanliness just because they don't cuss. And now you got them in everyone. I told her, I said, well, I guess there goes that, man. <laughs> you got to watch Discovery Channel, I guess. You know what one of the great uh, uh, theologians said? One of the great guys, uh, ph uh, ph not theologian, philosopher of theology that has to do with knowledge of God. People don't like theology, uh, philosophy. You know, one of the great philosophers, he wrote 12 or 13, I think 13 books that he wrote. The last one was the things that we learned from history. <laughs> He said, we have yet to uh, arrive at the period where the Greeks and the Romans were, where homosexuality was considered the norm. He wrote that in 1963. Were you there now? Considered the norm? It's on the Hallmark Channel. Now how am I going to have my kids watch a Christmas movie and they see that on there and then explain to them, uh, now that ain't right. How are you going to do that? You see two guys swishing together and, you know, come up and they meet and their eyes fall and they, and they you know, they get a lot. And then people are like, oh, we all should just, y'all should be together. You just, you just fit. You fit if you've been reading evolution. Do you know what they call evolution? 
probably don't, do you? It's called the theory. It's not a fact. Anybody with any sense knows that the first and second laws of thermodynamics right off of Jump Street completely abate any theory of evolution. It violates all of the rules across the board. But see, you forget you started in a garden. You know where an evolutionist begins? It begins with a hunter-gatherer. You didn't hunt. You were in a garden. You didn't think about that, did you? You say, why? You didn't come from an animal. You have to be an animal, and you have to hunt like an animal, and that's how you get it fixed. You know what they've even proven? They can't tell at what point mankind began to cultivate fields. I know when mankind began to cultivate fields. I have a Bible. That Bible says I started in a garden. Fruits and vegetables. Just fruit to begin with. And then I failed. You know what he said? He said, I'm going to earn it by the sweat of my brow. Thorns and thistles shall the ground bring forward. You didn't start off hunting. You started off working in the garden. Don't pay any attention to that. You say, what is that? That's years and years and years and years of the devil and humanity trying to convince you you're nothing better than an animal. You might be acting like animals now, but you're not an animal. And before you get good and jacked up about it, and I realize there may be certain exceptions, animals have better sense than human beings. They know you can't propagate with the same species, with the same sex. And you call yourself sophisticated and we've risen to the top because we, we're tolerant. Well, lest I digress, I've run out of my Sunday school hour. You'll probably be glad when the morning service comes. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm trying to convince you that you have been fed and brainwashed into believing in the church that the lowest form of humility is for you to be is self-abasement. I didn't say you have to go around telling everybody how great you are. Just stop talking and telling everybody how bad you are. I don't know about you. This may not be true for you, and I'm saying that tongue-in-cheek, but I actually mean it uh, when I say what I'm about to say. I don't know about you. I, I still sin. I still do things I shouldn't do. I still think things I shouldn't think. Uh, and those kind of things. And I, and I do. I promise with all my heart, I don't like to do it. I, I wish I could have complete victory over that. I wish I didn't even have the temptation to do or think wrong. You know, I wish I didn't feel anger come up in me. I wish I could just kind of like be cool as a cucumber all the time, be chill and all that stuff, or chilled out or whatever you call that. I, 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 but, but, you know, when, when, I, when I see somebody going 35, texting on the phone in the left-hand lane, And I'm trying to get somewhere and, and not break the speed limit. I just, I'm, I mean, the speed limit's 65 and, and the lane's clear. Now, I, I know what I should do is just kind of like, you know, go around them on the right-hand side. And, but there's something in me that wishes I had like a bulldozer blade on the front of my car and I could just like floor it and knock them out of the way with this message. Slower traffic, keep right. But then I think the guy would get out of his car and walk in the lane because he's the slower traffic. But there's something, and I realize I got that problem. And I have to ask the Lord to forgive me. But I am not going to be identified by my failures because he doesn't remind me of my failures. He's not at all like I am with other people. Maybe you don't have that problem. And instead of doing what the Bible tells me to do, forgiving others even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you, in the sense of saying the same way the Lord forgave you, forgive them. I don't have that one down yet. But I'm going to work on it. There's my New Year's resolution for 2021. <laughs> You say, do what? 
stop being so hard on my failures. I look in the mirror and I look across here and I think to myself, like a preacher told me, how long you been there? I said, 30 years. March was 30 years. You've been there 30 years? Quote, and that's all you've done? End quote. You say, well, well, what do you think about that? Well, see, I don't think about it like you. I don't get mad about it. I think, yeah. Maybe I missed it somewhere. Maybe I should have done something different. Maybe I should have changed. Maybe I should have... See? See? No, I'm, not. I'm, I'm just telling you. My sin is saying, I look at results and think because the results aren't there. See? And what I have to work on, I have to work on when that guy's name pops up on my phone. Not to go... <laughs> Voicemail. <laughs> you say, what? I think the Lord used that to show me that I need to get over myself. I'm doing the best I can. The rest of it's up to Him. But the temptation is. The temptation is. See? So I have that to deal with. I want to help you. I was, I was going to move on to long-suffering today. <laughs> I'll get there tonight. But folks, if there is one sin among Bible believers that I don't know if I've ever heard a Bible believer preach on it, not, I, I'm not the pinnacle of the tenemy of the temple or the poster child. I've never heard a sermon on self-abasement and you people being too hard on yourself. But I do know this. I know that we preach at the symptoms of it the root cause is how you feel about yourself. That's why you're such a jerk to other people. And if we could fix you, you could fix the symptom. Just stopping you from gossip and slander and lying and all those things, just stopping it doesn't fix the problem. It internalizes the problem. Right? Right? But the problem is how we feel about ourselves. That's why we always find somebody lower on the totem pole to pick on or somebody that we think is higher than we are to bring them down. And the Lord said, boy, you've got a problem. I've learned this, and I'll close Sunday school. I've learned this. It's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> I've learned this. I've learned a lot of times, I would say the majority of times, that God has had people in my life that I didn't care for and didn't want to be like and things like that to act as sandpaper to knock my own edges off. I've learned that. I've learned that when that thing shows up, God's bringing that person in my life to show me something about me. And I've missed a lot of good lessons. Because I wad up the sandpaper and throw it in the trash. The Lord's like, man, I was going to smooth you out with that. I was going to make you better, make you be able to fit better. You know, fit, fit together. Man, I, was, I got a niche for you over here, but I got to sand off some spots. Boy, have I missed some lessons. Throwing away the sandpaper. Father, bless your word. Pray you'll be with us in the upcoming hour. And pray that not everybody leaves after Sunday school. And uh, thank you for the beautiful weather that you gave us. Thank you for the work that's been done uh, here with the building and getting us prepared. And we'd ask now that you'll be with us in the upcoming service. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.